Well, hello and welcome to Over the Vast Nurseries on a fairly chilly, crisp day in early spring. You know, over the years, when I've been out and about, if there's one question that I probably get asked more than any others is, why isn't my hydrangea blooming? Well, in this video, we're going to explore why this happens. I'll explain possibly some tips and suggestions that you can do if it's happening to your plants. And we'll also look at some alternative varieties that might just work well in your area as well. So come with me now and we'll take a look at some of the plants here in this part of our display garden. Now the first thing to do is to try and identify what sort of hydrangea you have, because of course, there are several different sorts. It may be that you have some of these, what we call the panicle hydrangeas. They're the ones that have those big white conical flowers that as they mature, take on pink shades. But you know, they're really hardy, tough, very reliable plants, and it's probably not those. It might be that you've got the oak-leafed hydrangeas, which is this one here, really very beautiful. It might be that you have some hydrangea arborescence type, native variety, very hardy, flowers on the current year's wood. Normally that doesn't provide an issue. And it may be that you have some lace cap hydrangeas, very nice and normally quite reliable flowering too. But I suspect what most people have as a non-flowering, non-blooming hydrangea is this sort, the one that they call hydrangea microphylla, the mop head hydrangeas, or sometimes known as the big leafed hydrangeas. These are the ones that make big round dome shaped flower heads that can be pink or blue or sometimes white or red. And if you take a few moments and scroll through some of the videos that are elsewhere on this channel, you'll see that we featured lots of different varieties of most of these types that will help you perhaps find out the ones that you have too. And when you're there, can I suggest, if you haven't already, that you subscribe to our channel because we're busy posting new videos all the time. And then when you're subscribed, you'll find they'll turn up automatically as we post them. And of course, if there's any videos that you think are worthy of passing on to friends and other people, click the like button too, because that will help them find the videos and find that information as well. Now, let me say right at the outset that these are really beautiful and honestly not that hard to grow. But there's a couple of things that are worth knowing about. The first is that most of the varieties that you'll find in our garden centers and certainly in commerce today are probably descended from a species that grows in Japan in the southern and central part of Japan by the coast. They're really natural coastal plants. And that means that obviously by the ocean, it's warmer than say inland. And it makes people like myself that are growing them inland in colder localities rather jealous when I go and see them in places like Cape Cod, along on Long Island, along the Jersey coast, anywhere near the ocean where they seem to grow with absolute ease. That's their natural environment. And most of the older varieties that are in commerce are ones that have flower buds that are formed during the summertime. They then have to go through the autumn, through the winter, and now early spring before they emerge. And that's when the little embryonic bud comes out of that flower bud and then forms and then they flower during the summertime. If anything happens to those buds along that period, that obviously affects the flowering. So the ancestors of most of the varieties that we're growing in our gardens today have evolved in the conditions where it's moderate temperatures, not too hot, not too cold, plenty of rainfall, but also good sunlight too. Most of these varieties will need about four to six hours of sunlight per day. 
I remember a few years ago I did some experiments in my own garden. I planted some out in full sunlight. I put some in a partially shaded site and I put some just for the heck of it in a shady location too. Well, needless to say, the ones that were in a shady spot didn't flower too good. So remember that they really do need plenty of sunlight. That will help them set the flower buds during the summertime. Now a little tailpiece to that is that here with the intensity of our sun in the middle of the summer on a hot summer's day sometimes the flowers are going to not last as long as they would do if they were in a little bit of shade and that's why we usually recommend that we plant them somewhere where they'll get the morning sun but be protected from the hot afternoon sun so therefore partially shaded conditions with about four to six hours of sunlight is ideal. And the other point I'd quickly add <laughs> is that to be patient. You know here on the nursery and at our partnering garden centers we try to present nice big full premium sized plants that are ready to settle down and get off to a great start. But even then sometimes it takes a little while for them to settle in become established before they pass out of the adolescent stage and begin to get into the flowering mode. But most of the time, if they're not blooming, it's because something has happened to these embryonic flower buds. And fairly frequently, it's because they've been pruned either in the autumn, in the winter, or now in early spring. At this time of year, in early spring, you can do a little bit of cosmetic cleanup. You can remove the old flower heads. You might even go in and take out some of the old dead shoots in the middle of it here, but that is literally all you need to do in springtime. Leave these buds, allow them to grow out, and then carry the flowers during the summertime. If they get a little bit too big and you want to try to reduce the size, you can do that when the flowers are beginning to go over, leaving enough time for the new growth to grow out and set new flower buds for the following year. And if you stick with this channel, I'll be showing you a video on that when the time is right. Now the other thing to bear in mind is to make sure that the varieties that you're growing are ones that are suitable for your area. If you're in doubt, check with the experts at our partnering garden centers because they'll have a very good idea as to what grows well in your area, in your neighborhood. And I sometimes like to go out and look around at other people's gardens too because if there's a variety that's growing and flowering well in their garden, the chances are it's going to do well in your garden too. And I'm a little leery sometimes of the ones that are offered as pot plants, you know, for Mother's Day. They tend to be varieties that are short and compact and free flowering, but unless you live in an extra mild area, they may not have the bud hardiness that you would need for your zone. And here in my own garden, where I grow several different sorts of hydrangeas, an interesting thing happens. Some do remarkably well. And as you can see by the remains of the old flowers from last year, flower reliably without much care and attention and no protection whatsoever. Some others elsewhere in the garden do quite well and are really satisfactory. But <laughs> Then there's some like this one that are a downright disappointment and I only remember it flowering I think one year out of the 10 or 12 years that I've had it in this place. So if you're like me and you've got some hydrangeas that are not pulling their weight, is there anything you can do to try to get them to flower? Well there is in fact a couple of things that you could do, well at least a few that you could try. Let me show you what I mean. Now the first thing you could try is that if you have a garage or a basement like I have here that's cool and frost free, you could lift them, put them into a container and then bring them indoors here for the winter time just like I'm doing here with these tender evergreens. 
Now the second tip that I picked up is one that I discovered many years ago when I used to live in Ireland. I used to go and visit a lady who had the most magnificent collection of hydrangeas. When you went there in the summertime, they were just beautiful, covered in flowers and looking an absolute picture. But when I called in one morning in the middle of the winter, the sight wasn't nearly as pretty because she had all her hydrangeas covered with lots of old carpets and rugs. The idea, of course, was that the insulating matter in the carpets and rugs protected the flower buds and stopped them from freezing during the winter time. It worked beautifully for her, but the question is, do you really want to have your garden covered with lots of rugs and old carpets? And I've also heard tales of people using an upturned trash can. Just pop that over the top of the plant, weigh it down, of course, so that the wind wasn't going to rock it away. And if you really wanted to be smart about it, you could probably put some home insulation on the inside of the trash can, and that certainly should protect them. And of course, you could probably choose a better color than the blue one that I have here. The other thing that's interesting too is that the stems on hydrangeas are really quite flexible. So you're able to draw them in into a smaller space and therefore whatever protection you use can be smaller than if you left the plant on its own. Now my final little tip for you is an idea that I picked up from a lady in Syracuse. She was showing me how she uses leaves that she rakes up from her garden in the autumn time and then uses those to insulate the stems and buds of her hydrangeas. This is a nice airy light insulation mix and if you get something like this galvanized netting make it into a cone, tie in your branches and then just work perhaps with the bottom of a rake or something like that, be sure to try and get the leaves down into the bottom of the plant. It takes a little bit of work just to get that pushed down into the base of the column, but as you see, this is something that really works very well. You might have to top it up a little bit during the winter time, and I suppose also, once the galvanized material here weathers a little bit, you could probably spray paint it too, so that it blends in better with the environment. In fact, when I think about it, I think this is my preferred method. And certainly looking at the pictures that she showed me, her hydrangeas were beautiful. So I think this is probably a method that you might want to try at home. So if you've got some mop head hydrangeas that aren't flowering in your garden, there's a couple of tips you can try. In addition, it's worth keeping an eye out on the weather forecast, particularly at this time of year in early spring. We can get days like today that's cold and chilly, but we can also get usually very warm days too, days when you'd be out in a pair of shorts and t-shirts and the poor old plants aren't knowing whether they're coming or going. When those sort of conditions, the buds can break, they can flush, and then if we get an overnight frost, that can obviously create havoc. When that happens, it's handy to keep an eye on the weather forecast and then come up with some way to be able to protect the plants overnight. Some sort of temporary cover like this, a piece of cardboard, or better still, you might want to perhaps have something like this, a frost blanket. Keep that handy and then just stretch it over the top of the plants and that will often keep the frost at bay. The whole idea, of course, is to protect those precious buds so that then when the frost has passed, you can take this off and they will grow out and of course then produce lots of beautiful flowers.
but one of the most important breakthroughs in innovation and breeding in recent years has been the development of Remontan varieties. Remontan meaning that they have the ability to flower both on the old wood, the wood that was made the previous year, and also on new growth. The beautiful thing about that is, for those of us that live in colder areas, is that if you get a particularly cold winter or a killing frost and the tips are all killed, they still have the ability to grow out from the bottom of the plant, produce new growth. They'll flower a little later than normal, but at least they will grow out and flower. Now there are several different varieties that are remontant and it's also a scale. Some are very remontant, some are somewhat and some are just a little bit remontant. And in our trials and testing here we found some of the best performing remontant varieties and out of those I would say that Bloomstruck and Summer Crush from the Endless Summer line is probably some of the most remontant varieties. But some of the other ones are very good too and certainly well worth trying. And if you live in a colder area there's one more little trick I want to show you. In the autumn time, just when the plants are beginning to go into the winter time, get some extra mulch and cover up around the base of the plant because when you do that, that will provide valuable insulation that then will help to protect the base of the plants during the winter time. Then in springtime, you can go in and just remove the mulch, spread it around the bed and the base of your remontant hydrangea will be nice and toasty and warm and alive. And here's a good example of what a remontant variety might look like after a cold winter in a cold zone. As you see here on the tops of the plants, these are the old flowers from last year. The stem grew out and it flowered and here is the remains of the old flowers. But look at the stem here, you'll see that this stem is all kind of brown and flakes away and when you scratch the surface of the stem it's brown and dead. But look what's going on down here at the base of the plant and you'll see that there's strong healthy new shoots now pushing up from the crown of the plant and also elsewhere on the plant, further up on the stems, there are some live buds too and those are the ones that are now going to grow out this season and they're the ones that are going to flower on the current year's wood. So if you've got some plants like this at home, what do you do with it? Well, obviously all of this material is dead. So there's no point leaving it because there's no live growth there. You can start off if you want and trim from the top of the plant and go down until you think that there's some live wood. Take out all of the old dead material out of the inside of it because it's not going to grow from there and it's not really going to do any good anyway. So as I say, if you're wondering, look at this shoot here, it's dead. So you take that right out here at the bottom like that. But if, say, you're wondering, and here's an example, let me take this one out of the way so that you can see. If you look here, you'll see that this shoot here has some live buds on it at this point. It looks like this is probably pretty dead there, and yes it is, so I'll take that out. But here's one that possibly might have some live material up here. Certainly it's got life in it there at those buds. So you just shorten it back a little bit above it, taking it back and then wait to see what happens because the chances are that these are now going to grow out and then of course flower this summer. So there you are as you see, there's good healthy buds about to sprout. There might be a bit of growth coming out of that one. There's certainly one here about to break out. And then just go through and take a look at the other shoots. This one here, it's as dead as a dodo. So that comes right out. And just really work your way around the plant. Look here, there's a nice strong healthy bud there. This might, that's dead. And it looks like this bud here is dead too. Yes, look at that. So that comes out when I get my secretaries operating and then 
I'm going to take this one out just above the bud and that'll help really give it a good chance to get going away. And now as you see I've trimmed away all of the old dead wood back to whatever buds are alive and the only thing left to do really now is to put down a dressing of a well-balanced fertilizer. It calls for a couple of teaspoonfuls per plant and so you just really put that around the perimeter of the plant. That's going to supply nutrient that obviously then is going to encourage the growth. The only thing I'd say about fertilizers is a general well-based fertilizer will be fine. Just be careful not to overdo it because if you create a lot of lush strong growth that might be a little on the soft side going into next winter. So put it on fairly sparingly and no time at all these shoots are going to be up and growing and flowering. So there you are now you know what you can do to get your hydrangeas blooming. This is David Wilson. Enjoy your gardening. It's good for us and it's very good for our environment too.